The quaint town of Cheshire, Connecticut held the dark secret behind its white picket fences and charming homes. What happened there on a warm July night in 2007 would shake the community to its core and captivate the entire nation. You can forgive somebody who stole your car, somebody who insulted you. Mm -hmm. Forgiving the essence of evil is not appropriate. It began as many stories do, with a chance encounter at the local stop and shop between a predator and his unsuspecting prey. 48-year-old Jennifer Hawk Pettit and her bright-eyed 11-year-old daughter, Michaela Pettit, were picking up groceries for a family dinner that night. As they cheerfully made their selections, chatting about recipes and Michaela's day at school, a sinister set of eyes watched them from the shadows. 26-year-old Joshua Andrew Commissar Jevsky. After Jennifer and Michaela left the store and drove home, Commissar Jevsky quickly reached out to his criminal accomplice, 44-year-old Stephen Hayes. He sent an eager text saying, I'm chomping at the bit to get started. Need a margarita soon. Hayes responded, We are still on? And Commissar Jevsky confirmed, Yes. When Hayes replied soon, Commissar Jevsky tried to be patient, texting back, I'm putting the kid to bed. Hold your horses. But Hayes was ready for violence, responding, Dude, the horses want to get loose. LOL. Their cryptic messages revealed the evil brewing. Commissar Jevsky's interest in the kid likely referred to young Michaela. Together, these two men would bring unimaginable terror to the petted family. Joshua followed them home, taking note of their idyllic two-storied house on Sorghum Mill Drive. Inside was Jennifer's husband, Dr. William Pettit, and their older daughter, 17-year-old Haley, a talented and vivacious girl who was soon heading off to Dartmouth College in the fall to study medicine. The Pettits seemed like the perfect American family, their home a haven of happiness and love. That night, their plan was simple, break into the Pettit home and steal some quick cash. But what transpired in the coming hours would destroy an entire family and shake the foundations of the community's sense of security. Under the cover of darkness, Hayes and Commissar Jevsky snuck into the basement of the Pettit home. Dr. Pettit was sleeping on the couch when Commissar Jevsky grabbed a baseball bat he found nearby and brutally beat William with it, leaving him bloodied and unconscious. The men then bound William's wrist and ankles tightly with rope and plastic zip ties to a pole in the basement. One chillingly told the other, if he moves, put two bullets in him. The terrified family was rounded up with Jennifer, 17-year-old Haley, and young Michaela tied spread eagle to their beds upstairs. Pillowcases were placed over their heads as the two men ransacked the home, searching greedily for cash and valuables. Unsatisfied with the modest haul of jewelry and a couple hundred dollars swiped from purses, Commissar Jevsky and Hayes escalated their terrifying crimes. They spotted a checkbook and bank statements, realizing bigger money could be seized by forcing Jennifer to withdraw funds. Hayes dragged Jennifer to the bank to withdraw $15,000 from her account, a last humiliating errand before her life would end in unimaginable horror. Inside the bank, Jennifer quietly informed the teller that two men were holding her family hostage back at their home, threatening to kill them all if she did not withdraw money. The bank manager, observing the alarming interaction, immediately called 911 to report the situation as it unfolded in real time. Jennifer conveyed to the teller her belief that the home invaders were being nice and likely just wanted money. But the manager still urgently updated law enforcement, unsure of the true danger level. Police mobilized covertly nearby after getting the call, establishing a perimeter around the bank. But they did not storm the building or reveal their presence, as the situation remained uncertain. All this was captured on the bank's surveillance cameras, unbeknownst to Jennifer and her kidnapper Hayes. The footage would later provide irrefutable evidence of just how calculating the killer's moves had been that morning. After withdrawing $15,000 in cash, 
Jennifer left the bank accompanied by Hayes. Now under police surveillance, the pair drove back to her home in the ongoing nightmare. The 911 call and footage showed Jennifer's captors had forced her to drain the family's accounts, likely to fund their future escapes once their crimes were done. Police were just minutes away, but tragically still unable to stop the horror unfolding at the Pettit residence. Meanwhile, the nightmare was intensifying back at the Pettit home. With both parents captive, the burglary turned increasingly sinister. The sexual violated their helpless young captives as Hayes assaulted Jennifer and Commissar Jeffsky raped 11-year-old Michaela. Somehow, William Pettit had managed to slip his restraints and escape the basement unseen. Barefoot and bleeding profusely from his head wounds, he staggered to a neighbor's yard, shouting for help. The neighbor, struggling to recognize Pettit through his gruesome injuries, quickly took him in and called 911. Police now knew the gravity of the home invasion. Tragically, police had already been notified an hour earlier by the bank manager, but had failed to take swift action. When officers arrived on the scene, their superiors inexplicably instructed them to not enter the house or engage with the perpetrators. Police set up a perimeter around the Pettit residence, but did nothing more as the horror continued to unfold just yards away. The decision to not storm the home likely stemmed from suspicion of Jennifer herself. Police wondered if she was complicit in draining the accounts, given her reportedly calm demeanor at the bank. So while Jennifer was being assaulted inside, police stood by outside the home, taking no steps to contact or assist the victims. In the aftermath, Jennifer's sister publicly criticized law enforcement's failure to save them. After police wasted the critical hour just passively waiting and watching, if not for the misguided hesitation by leadership, police on the scene may have been able to halt the violence before it was too late. But protocols and poor judgments led officers to stay their hand with devastating consequences. By the time they converged back on the Pettit residence, it was too late. Hayes and Commissar Jeffsky had already initiated their plan to destroy the evidence of their heinous crimes. The sexual assaults now finished. The pair doused the girls' rooms and beds with gasoline, leaving their victims helplessly bound to the beds. Jennifer was strangled by Hayes' hands. Her life extinguished just before the flames were lit. In an act of sheer evil, the two criminals set the house ablaze, with the Pettit girls still alive and screaming. Haley and Michaela ultimately died from smoke inhalation, though 11-year-old Michaela's last moments were no doubt filled with unspeakable terror and pain. Haley managed to break free from her ties before succumbing to the smoke, collapsing in the hallway at the top of the staircase as she ran out of her bedroom. The fire raged as Hayes and Commissar Jeffsky made their hurried escape in the family's car. Police tracked down Commissar Jeffsky and Hayes as they fled in the Pettit's car. They closed in quickly, and within blocks, the getaway vehicle crashed into a patrol car. Officers swarmed the scene, arresting both men as they desperately tried to flee on foot. After seven long hours, the home invasion from hell had ended. The shocking case made headlines across the nation. The brutal murders cast a pall over the once charming town, leaving residents fearful and demanding justice. What punishment could ever fit such a horrific crime? Stephen Hayes had a long criminal history, with his first conviction at age 16. In and out of jail for decades, he met Commissar Jeffsky after being paroled in 2006. Joshua Commissar Jeffsky was adopted and even sexually abused his younger sister as a teen. He committed his first burglary at 14 and escalated to a string of home invasions as an adult. He served nine years in prison before being paroled, just months before targeting the Pettit family. Commissar Jeffsky's trial followed in 2011, with his lawyers blaming Hayes as the ringleader. Joshua sought to pin the blame on Hayes, claiming he never intended for things to end so violently. But this did not square with Commissar Jeffsky's history of nighttime home invasions, done solely to terrorize sleeping families. Later on, Commissar Jeffsky was also found guilty 
and given the death penalty. At sentencing, he claimed some responsibility, but said he never meant for anyone to die. Hayes' defense claimed he was manipulated by the mastermind, Thomas Arjewski, into escalating the crime. But overwhelmingly damning evidence showed Hayes' equal culpability. Hayes' fresh gasoline-soaked clothes alone spoke volumes, underscoring his direct role in the attempted cover-up. After weeks of dramatic testimony, Hayes was convicted on 16 of 17 charges. Moving statements given by Dr. Pettit himself ensured Commissar Jeski faced no leniency either. Listening to the father describe his personal holocaust, the jury unanimously decided Commissar Jeski too deserved to die for his unconscionable acts. After months inside the courtroom reliving the trauma, the 12 jurors had more than done their duty. In an unprecedented move, the state of Connecticut provided counseling to help these ordinary citizens process the haunting and disturbing memories seared into their minds. As Commissar Jeffsky and Hayes sat condemned on death row, awaiting execution, the legal saga of the Cheshire case took more twists and turns. In 2012, Connecticut abolished capital punishment for future crimes, but the legislature purposely excluded those already sentenced not wanting the infamous killers to escape their punishment. This changed in 2015, when Connecticut Supreme Court, in a hotly debated decision, ruled the death penalty unlawful. The court commuted prior death sentences like those of Hayes and Commissar Jeffsky, essentially giving the murderers a last-minute pardon from execution. Dr. William Pettit and other family members expressed outrage, feeling the cruel killers undeserving of any mercy. But there was nothing left to do but accept the hated men would live out their days in prison rather than face execution. The 2007 Cheshire home invasion rocked the quiet Connecticut suburb. The aftershocks permeated the community for years through exhaustive investigations, documentaries, trials, and fierce death penalty debates. The brutal murder of Jennifer Hawk Pettit and her daughters Haley and Michaela and the miraculous survival of Dr. William Pettit left an indelible mark on Connecticut's history. The enduring memory of that tragic midsummer night in 2007 cautions us that even in the most idyllic of American neighborhoods, unspeakable evil may lurk in the shadows.